Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the God. We are The Breakfast Club. We have a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. We have author Mel Robbins. Welcome. Wow, thank you. And motivational speaker and a host of others. Yes, a lot of things. How are you doing this morning? And welcome on the show. Well, I'm uh, I'm super excited. We got so much to talk about, and uh, I cannot wait to just get into it all. Well, who, who is Mel Robbins for the folks that don't know? Who am I? Yes. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm somebody that screwed up a lot in life. Ooh. Yeah, I tend to, to come by uh, a, a wisdom the hard way. Okay. By either digging a hole or falling into one and then needing a ladder mm-hmm. and having to build it myself. Well, those are the kind of people I like to listen to. I like to listen to people who've actually had experiences that they can speak on. Whether those experiences are so-called good or so-called bad. Because I don't believe in either. I just believe life is a process. Yeah, I think life is like... Uh, the hardest and most incredible school you'll yeah, ever attend. Absolutely. And everything is a lesson. And, uh, you know, I kind of came into writing books and being a motivational speaker because I have had so many struggles, just like everybody else. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think anybody gets to being an adult in life and not experiencing some kind of trauma or mm-hmm. abuse or whatever. It's hot in here. We didn't pay the AC bill. Well, I'm also 53. I could be like everybody's mother. And so I'm having a lot. Yeah, it's a little, it's, it's a hot it's flash really and it's hot in here, right? It's hot in here. Yeah, I don't uh, know how old you think we are, but yeah. yeah. Uh, you'd have been, been, yes. you, been a very, very young mother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> My mom was a very young mom too. Um, but no, so I uh, have had a, a lifelong struggle with anxiety, which is one of the reasons why I'm so excited Same. to talk to you guys. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I have these two books that uh, became instant bestsellers because I just have this crazy knack of taking really complicated stuff mm-hmm. and coming up with really almost simple, cheesy ways to explain mm-hmm. things that are memorable, that anybody can use uh, with any level of education or no education at all to attack issues like anxiety, depression, PTSD, uh, procrastination, and that's been my gift. And had, so, you had ADD. You have ADD. A O. Oh, do Diagnosed I have ADD? ADD? <laughs> yes. Yes. In fact, here's a really interesting fact for all the women listening. Mm-hmm. When ADD first became a diagnosis in uh, 1970, they studied boys, and when boys have ADD or ADHD, they present very different thing, differently than girls do. So, boys, I have a son that has really bad ADHD. He's like shaking his legs and he's bouncing all around mm-hmm. and interrupting everybody when girls have adhd check this out they literally are quiet they're hard on Mm. themselves they daydream and so what happens when you have adhd and you're not diagnosed is you start to present with anxiety this is why so many kids are having issues in school i believe it's because when you're not properly figure it out in terms of your learning style and you sit in a classroom and you cannot concentrate or you, your brain's just not working the way that they want you to learn. doesn't mean it's a bad brain. It just means you learn differently, which can be a real gift. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you start to act out because you can't do what's being asked of you. And so then you start to get labeled like you're a problem kid or you're this mm-hmm. or that. When really the underlying issue is that you have a learning style that's different. And because you can't do what's being asked of you, you start to have mental health issues. So back to women, the majority of women that start to present with anxiety in their late teens and early 20s, we we have research has now shown, actually had an underlining learning issue, Mm. like or had ADHD, a focus issue. So for me, my underlying issue all along had been ADHD. We never diagnosed it, and so it presented as anxiety. I started having crushing anxiety uh, late in my teens, got diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder in my mid-20s, was on Zoloft for two and a half decades, only come to find out, holy shit, I have ADHD because our son started having all kinds of issues mm-hmm. acting out at school. How was he How was he treated? Is he treated with medicine or is he treated with therapy? How do you tr- how, Both. How is he treated? Both. Well, first we figured out that he has dyslexia. 
and that the anxiety was coming from the fact that underneath it all, the kid was in fourth grade and could not read. That's right. Mm-hmm. So of course he's not able to pay attention. And this is a huge. This is a huge uh, uh, kind of passion project for me because I started my career as a legal aid lawyer here in New York City doing criminal defense work. Oh, you so, got paid absolutely positively uh, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I got paid nothing, but it was the best job I ever had in my mm-hmm. entire life. And I worked for legal aid here, did criminal defense work. And it was very interesting me to, for me to learn that the majority of folks that are incarcerated actually have a learning disability. Right. Mm. And I think that, you know, look, there's a, tons of complex issues that can set somebody off course from the path that they deserve and they desire in life. But I believe that a lot of times what happens for kids is that you're in a classroom, you're not able to do what's being asked of you, you start to feel invisible, mm-hmm. you start to feel frustrated, you start to feel less than. You feel like you're getting picked on by teachers Correct. and everybody else because they keep to, calling on you. And yep. then to your point, you start telling yourself that you're a failure, like you said in the book, and believing that you're yes. a failure. Yes, and then when you start to internalize this messaging, whether it's from society or it's from your home life, or it's from a school system that typecasts you and sends you in a particular mm-hmm. direction, uh, that's when all kinds of things start to happen with your mental health, with your sense of identity, with your confidence. And so, you know, for us, you know, we we were lucky enough to figure out, okay, this kid's got issues. Let's take him to see a therapist. They definitely diagnosed him with, with anxiety, but then thankfully his teacher's like, uh, he can't read. You guys need to get them tested outside of this school. Mm-hmm. And at that point in our lives, thankfully, we could afford to. And we find out the kid has dyslexia. And so when wow. we remediated the dyslexia, all of a sudden the anxiety goes away. Mm. How do you feel about monastery schools? How do I feel about what? Montessori, Montessori. schools. Montessori. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know a lot about them because my kids did not go to a mm-hmm. monastery. My kids just went to the public high school or public school in our in the town that we're in. But then our son went to a school that remediated the dyslexia. I think... Whatever school makes your kid feel seen and right. makes your kid excited to learn, that is the right school for you. I it don't care. It for every kid. Yeah. Because I have, I have five, and some of them went to Montessori schools, and whatever your kid is into, they push that towards your kid. Amazing. And it, and it works for some, but, but my, my, one of my sons, it didn't work for because he needed a little bit of everything. So yeah. it's for each, each individual kid. Yeah. Exactly. And social and emotional learning is something that they need to be implementing in school starting in kindergarten, I believe. Well, I, I not only believe that, but I feel like school is kind of the, the shot to give kids everything that they need. Because, I, you know, I, I, I feel like if there's a place where kids can be looked at as a whole individual and there are services that, that, are, met, that are about mindset and about wellness and about health, if you can help kids that way, give them whole foods, give them the support you need in terms of your mental health, give them the support you need physically. I mean, we, we could spend hours just talking about the fact that they need to just start school with exercise every That's morning right. mm. because of the, the mm-hmm. research that shows that if you simply get some sort of cardio exercise first thing in the morning, it boosts your focus it helps with your ability really? to pay attention. Oh, yeah. There's yes. this amazing Hell book. Yeah. You know, you guys got, there's a book called Spark that Dr. John Rady from Harvard Medical School wrote. They did this incredible program in Naperville where they have, uh, they, they, they was, I don't even have, I don't have the, the correct information in front of me. But what they basically did is they start school in the morning with physical education and a particular type of it like circuit training mm-hmm. and they saw the the incidence of aggression and violence go way down they saw test scores go way up really? there's a huge correlation because what happens when you uh exercise first thing in the morning is your brain releases all these chemicals that help you direct your attention and it helps your mind work in the way it's designed to work to help you. I'm what gonna about make my nutrition? kids work out in the morning. Now. <laughs> the book is called Spark. I'm gonna make my kids work you out in the morning. You should get Dr. Now. John Rady on the show. I think you'd find her. Oh, or Ned to. Hollowell, who's the world's leading expert on ADHD. Okay. Let's Along talk- with exercise, what about nutrition for kids in the morning? Because I know sometimes they don't have the best options. Oh my god, I don't know. If you can figure that out, let me know. I mean, like I have I, our our son would not eat anything that had texture. 
You know, he, he literally, what? if it had a particular color, like I, I literally, I was the kind of mom that was like, okay, if I can get a chocolate smoothie in you and stink and, and, and sneak some protein powder with some sort of green in there, I, if you can get them to eat that stuff, you are winning. <laughs> That's all I can say. Things can be healthy and taste good, though. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We work on now, that. Now, I had a picky kid, so I can't give advice about that. <laughs> Let's talk about the high five habit. You yes. You know, uh, take control of your life with one simple yes. habit. What is yes. What is that habit? Okay, so first I got to tell you. Okay. This is going to sound like the stupidest thing you've ever heard. Mm-hmm. And do not make the mistake of dismissing this because the idea is stupid. Because I stumbled into something. Again, I fell into a hole. This is the most powerful thing I have ever discovered in my entire life. And it unpacks decades of research in psychology, in uh, human behavior and habits. It's insane. And so um, what is it? Basically, you're going to stand in front of the mirror every morning Mm -hmm. right after you brush your teeth. Mm -hmm. And I want you to do it after you brush your teeth because we know based on research that your brain learns uh, new habits when you stack it with an old habit. So hopefully we're all brushing the gunk out of our mouths so we're not Mm -hmm. spreading dragon breath all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. Now I want to teach you using science how to uh, get all of the gunk out of your mind, body, and spirit. spirit. And I'm talking generational shit here. Okay. So as you stand in front of the mirror, you're going to put your toothbrush down and you're going to look in the mirror. That's step one. Now, this is the hardest part for most people. And I actually read the interview that you said uh, when, when you announced the Mental Wealth Alliance. Mm-hmm. There was an article that, you, that was written about you in Forbes. Mm-hmm. And there was a quote there that I loved because this is what the high five habit is all about. You were talking about the fact, uh, you know, about how the black community had been impacted by the pandemic. And you said, I've never had more people call me, FaceTime me or text me saying, yo, bro, I'm ready to talk to somebody. Everybody's sitting at home and having to deal with themselves all the time. And there's a lot of people who are just seeing themselves for the first time, and they may not necessarily like what they see. Mm. The fact of the matter is 50% or more of men and women can't even look at themselves in the mirror. That's right. Because they do not like the person that they see. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they don't like themselves is so sad They either, like every morning in the mirror, when you simply stand there and you look at yourself in the mirror, you're not alone and that's not your reflection. I believe you're in that bathroom with another human being. And that human being needs you. They are trying their best. They have been trying so hard. They are so sick and tired of being picked apart. They're tired of your negativity. They are tired of your self-doubt. They are Mm. tired of being beaten down by you. And the reason why... Most people cannot even look at themselves in the mirror is because if you're a human being, you have a past that is filled with all kinds of crap. Mm -hmm. There's not a human being that hasn't experienced some level of trauma. I know in Grand Rapids, Michigan, I'm from Muskegon, Michigan. They just uh, the, the officials there just actually said that racism is the leading mental health crisis. Thankfully, people are starting to talk about this. Mm -hmm. And so. You've either experienced trauma or abuse or neglect or mm-hmm. abandonment or and you drag that into the bathroom every morning and it stands between you and the human being in the mirror. And, and there are so many people that think that they are not worthy or that they are damaged or not lovable because of what they've survived. That's right. That's right. Or if you're human, you've done a lot of stuff that you regret. Mm-hmm. You've cheated. You've lied. You've 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 hurt other people. You've hurt yourself. You've squandered opportunity. You've stolen stuff. I mean, everybody has stuff they regret, stuff that they would forgive all of us for. Mm -hmm. But you stand in judgment of the human being in the mirror. And so, number one, you may find it super challenging just to do the part where you look in the mirror. But what I want you to do is I want you to then raise your hand, as cheesy as it sounds, I want you to high five the human being you see. And what's incredible about this simple habit is that Number one, you have high-fived other people your whole life. So, Charlemagne, when you high-five somebody, what does the gesture itself mean? Um, I'm greeting them, want them to be seen, want them to feel seen, want them to know that I recognize them, yeah. I respect them. Me. What are you thinking when you high-five me? I recognize them, I respect them, yeah. I have a, a love for them. Yeah. yeah. That's what you feel? 
Yeah, and maybe it's a Angela, congratulations on something yeah. that you accomplished. Mm-hmm. They've accomplished, and you're acknowledging that. Yeah. Now here's this. This is where the high five habit gets bananas. Mm-hmm. Since you have been high fiving and receiving high fives from tons of people your whole life, mm-hmm. your mind, body, and spirit is already programmed with the messaging of a high five. There is neural association mm-hmm. with the physical trigger of doing this. So when you go to high five yourself, no matter how weird it feels or resistant you are to it, your brain turns all that judgment off and it picks up the neural association with a lifetime of high five and and receiving high fives. You have never once thought envy. I hate you as you high five somebody. You've never once thought you loser. Mm -hmm. I hope you lose. Today's going to be. You've never, ever, ever done it. Unless you like you got to be one of the most fakest backstabbing people in the world to do something. I don't even think anybody can do it. I don't think do a high five with somebody. Yeah, because Mm -hmm. here's the thing. Like you literally like if you and I high five right now. Yeah. If we high five right now. Right. If we have five right now. All right, I'll reach over. Right, here we go. Yes. I feel like I should receive something. Yes, you have to receive. Like we just won. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, you know what that is? Your brain doesn't know the difference between me high-fiving Envy or Angela or you mm-hmm. or me high-fiving myself. So that, that feeling that you just got, that's dopamine. Mm-hmm. Your brain gives you a drip of dopamine mm-hmm. every morning when you high-five yourself. That celebratory, yeah, 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 that's your nervous system programming. Your nervous system remembers celebratory gestures of waving hello, of hugging. And so what's incredible is you get the benefit of a lifetime of programming from the dopamine drip to the celebration in your nervous system. That's not all, you guys. There is so much freaking research about the high five. So they studied NBA teams, okay? Mm -hmm. There's this huge article Mm -hmm. in the Wall Street Journal in 2011 where they studied NBA teams and researchers were able to predict who were going to be the best performing teams at the end of the season by looking at one habit during the preseason. And the habit they studied was how many times did the team give each other pats on the back or fist bumps or high fives during the preseason? What about pats on the butt? Oh, sure. That works too. Okay. Absolutely. That feels really good. And so uh, what happens is when you give somebody a high five or a fist bump or a pat on the butt, these are more than just gestures. These build trust and partnership. Mm -hmm. And so the teams that do that the most in the preseason go on to have the winningest seasons. Mm. The teams that do it the least Mm -hmm. actually do the worst because you've got a bunch of players that are in it for themselves. So we should do it more as a community. Yes. And (laughs) you should do it. You should start by doing it to yourself. I'll tell you why. Because we are all looking outside ourselves for the validation, love, respect, support that we need. And we need for ourselves, for our children, to teach ourselves to be able to stand in front of the mirror and give that same validation, Mm -hmm. support, self-worth, and love to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because if you learn how to like, respect, forgive, support yourself, yeah, it sucks when somebody else doesn't like you. But it won't change the fact that you like yourself. I do that in the mirror. I don't high five, but I say, you know, I, I look in the mirror and say, I forgive you. You know, you are worthy. Um, I have conversations with my inner child. Like I mm-hmm. look at old pictures of, of you know, me in sixth grade. Or yeah. Times I know I experienced different traumas and yeah. I talk to that, talk to that little boy. Yeah. That is incredible. And I know that you are a huge advocate for therapy and you've been in therapy. Mm-hmm. One of the things about talking to yourself, and this is interesting, we write about it in the book, is that for most people it doesn't work. And here's why. They don't believe it yet. Mm. And don't so, believe what? They don't believe any positive affirmation. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when I recommend that you do the high five habit, I want you to just try it for five days. It will feel feel weird. And the reason why it's going to feel weird is because right now everybody has the opposite habit. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a dirty little thing that nobody's Mm -hmm. talking about. Every morning in the bathroom right now, everybody's, you know, talking morning routines. You got to meditate. You got to practice gratitude. You got to exercise. You got to eat good foods. You got to do all this good stuff. But the way that everybody starts their day is with a habit of self-rejection. 50% of people cannot look in the mirror. That's a habit of rejecting yourself. That's real. And 91% of women don't like how they look. And so what do most of us do when we look in the mirror? We focus on the stuff we can't stand. You criticize yourself. Correct. Correct. The, the, you know, if you want to know why you're so hard on yourself, it's because every morning you have this habit already baked in of starting your day by picking apart the things you don't like. 
That's what is deepening insecurity. Well, how, how did you learn all of this? How did you learn to give yourself a high five? <laughs> I mean, you. How did you learn to talk to yourself? Like, you know, how, how did you get to that point? Well, and to your credit, from what you said earlier, you've been through a lot. Like you yes. said, bankruptcy, Well, everybody's been issues. through a lot. Everybody's but, been through know, a lot. But you know, some people... I mean, bankruptcy is a really difficult thing. Yes. I, and yes. finances can be crushing yes. for a person. Yes. So I'll tell you the story about what I call the five second rule mm -hmm. and being almost a million dollars in debt in, and about to lose everything in 2008. But how I discovered the high five habit mm -hmm. was, um, you know, I used to be a daytime syndicated talk show host mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I lost that dream job on March 10th in 2020 when they found COVID at CBS Broadcast Center. And they walked in and said, show's over, you're fired, five minutes to evacuate the building. Wow. And so I find myself back home, just like everybody else, my whole life turned upside down uh, in an instant. The kids uh, have their college uh, experience imploded. We're now all quarantining back at home. Mm -hmm. Every single speech I have for a year cancels. And I find myself in a free fall. And this is before the PPP loans come out and, you know, we're all in quarantines, right. kids are in breakdown, anxiety's coming back. And I'm having flashbacks mm -hmm. to 2008 where my husband and I were losing everything. And uh, I wake up one morning with the very familiar feeling of just feeling overwhelmed by my life mm. and feeling the anxiety pinning me down in that bed like a gravity blanket. Mm -hmm. And I know not to lay in that bed. And I'll tell you the story about the five second rule in a minute, because you definitely want to know this when it comes to mental health. So I count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, I get out of bed. I drag myself to the bathroom and I'm standing there in the bathroom and I literally catch a glimpse of my reflection. And I think, oh my God, you look like hell. And then I start picking apart the woman I see in the mirror. The dark circles under my eye, one boob hanging lower than the other. I start thinking about my day, and it's negative. You got eight minutes to get on Zoom. You you know how you get. You didn't return that call. How are you going to get out of this mess? It's a beat down. The beat. Down. This is mm -hmm. how most people start their day. Yeah, even though you should have gave yourself so much grace. Yeah. No. Nope. Just that. Be, it's a habit. Like that's yeah. what folks don't understand is that you're not broken. You have patterns of thinking and patterns of behavior that make you feel broken. Mm -hmm. And the good news is, if you understand it's a pattern, you can catch it and break it. And so I don't know what came over me, Envy, because I'm not a cheesy person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it sounds pathetic. You're standing there in your underwear in your bathroom, you know. And if you had walked into the bathroom that morning or you had walked into the bathroom that morning, I would have been able to spin on a dime and pick you up. I would have been able to say, oh, Angela, I know this is not fair, but if anybody can handle this, it's you. I don't believe you'd have done that with random strangers just walking in your bathroom. I don't think that. <laughs> First thing I don't think that. Yeah, I don't think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that would have been your mindset. If you, if so, you're the most positive person ever. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, uh, I don't know what. Came. I actually think it was divine intervention. I really do. Mm -hmm. Because I literally just raised my hand without even thinking about it and high five the woman in the mirror because she needed it. And I laughed the second my hand hit the mirror because it's so cheesy. Now, in that moment, it was not like lightning struck. Mm -hmm. I was not like, this is it. I'm going to write a book about this. Oh, yeah, my life has changed. That's mm -hmm. not what happened. But I felt what you felt after we high-fived. I felt my shoulders drop. And I felt this sort of like energy come through me. I now know that's my nervous system programming from a high-five. It's mm -hmm. the neural association working. And I felt like, all right, come on. You got a roof over your head. It's not that bad. Get your ass out there. Like, that was kind of the mood. It was the second morning. The second morning is when it hit me. Because I woke up and I was really overwhelmed by life. Everybody knows that feeling. And just not knowing how I was going to get through the day or solve all these problems. And I was walking to the bathroom. I felt something I had never felt in my adult life. And this is so sad. I realized I was having this feeling. You know, you know that feeling when you're about to walk into a bar or cafe and you're going to see somebody you really like? What do you feel in that moment right before you're about to walk in? Uh, excited, butterflies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I felt that about the idea of seeing myself. Wow. What just hit you? Um, gra I guess gratitude, you know, like, um, I always try to have a 
I mean, worthiness is a tricky thing, right? Yeah. But the, I think the first step to worthiness is just having gratitude. And like, you know, Bishop T.D. Jakes told me something one time. He said, even if you don't feel like you're worthy, God knows you're worthy. Correct. So waking up in the morning and just knowing that I'm still here, still alive, God has some type of plan for me. Yeah. And Mel, what do you do about things like jealousy and comparing yourself to other people when it comes to taking control of your life? It's a great question. I never understood jealousy and envy. And Sorry, envy. it used to <laughs> consume me, <laughs> you know, like I'd be so jealous of people. But what I realized and what I write about in this book is that jealousy is an amazing thing because it's it's a directional signal. Jealousy is just blocked desire. And if you can remove the insecurity and the, the unworthiness that blocks it, you can let your jealousy point you in the direction of things that are meant for you. That's right. Because you can only be jealous or envious of things that you actually desire. Like, I'm not envious of anybody that has a huge penthouse in Dubai. I don't want to live there. Mm -hmm. But if you're jealous of somebody, unpack it. Give yourself permission to lean toward it because then the people that you envy or you're jealous of no longer are evidence it's not going to happen for you or somebody beat you to it. That's your insecurity talking. Your envy and your jealousy is inspiration and desire. Then other people become lights on the path of your life That's to right. inspire you. And, and you know, you asked the question about, you know, the, the five second rule. I should explain this really quickly because this is what helped me actually uh, interrupt all the patterns that caused anxiety. Uh, stop taking medication, get control of my mindset. And literally, I have situational anxiety. I never have general anxiety anymore, ever, because I understand it now. So I invented something called the five second rule in 2008. And at the time, my husband had gone into the restaurant business. He had a little pizza, he had a pizza joint outside of Boston, Massachusetts with his best friend. And uh, the first one did really, really well. So like complete idiots, we cashed out our entire life savings, the kids college fund. We took out a home equity line because that's free money, right? What could possibly go wrong in the restaurant <laughs> business? Mm -hmm. And what went wrong is the second location was a total disaster. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves $800,000 in debt, Yikes. three kids under the age of 10, mm. uh, credit cards maxed out. I lost my job. Liens hit the house. I, of course, face these problems like a high-functioning adult, and that is by drinking myself into the ground and screaming at my husband whenever. Hearing you say that, give me just a little anxiety. Like, <laughs> make sure you make the right Ooh. investments. Don't, oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> yeah. And so I was waking up every morning pinned to bed with anxiety. And I became a person I didn't recognize. Like, I was drunk by 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I was angry all the time. I would lie in bed in the morning and stare at the ceiling, just pinned with anxiety. I felt like the world's worst mom, the worst wife, the, a huge failure. The kids were missing the bus every day. Mm. And here's the thing about life. You can know what to do. That's the easy part. And if you don't know what to do, Google it, because there's a thousand videos and books and stuff that will get you started. The secret to life is knowing how. How do you make yourself take action when you're scared, when you're doubting yourself, when you're afraid, when you don't believe in yourself? How do you do that? You're talking to somebody this morning. You're preaching. What's the how, though? How? Well, the how is the five-second rule. Okay. Yep. So I invented this crazy thing in desperation. One night I'm sitting there, I'm giving myself this pep talk. I'm like, tomorrow morning, Mel, you got to get up. you got to get these kids on the bus. You have got to stop screaming at your husband. You've got to stop drinking. You have got to look for a job, woman. You know, and by God, when that alarm rings, you cannot lay there in bed. And honest to God, it was another God moment. A rocket ship shot across the television screen. And I thought, that's it. That's the secret. Tomorrow morning when the alarm goes off, you're going to launch yourself out of bed like a rocket ship. You're going to move so fast. Five, four, three, two, five, one. Five, three, Get two, up. one. You're not going to be in that bed <laughs> when that anxiety hits. The very next morning, I'll never forget, it was a Tuesday in February outside of Boston, Massachusetts. The alarm goes off. Now, I'm going to show you something that once you see this, you will never be able to unsee it. There is a five-second window that defines your whole life. It's a moment of hesitation. Inside this window is the difference between confidence and doubt, courage and fear, inspiration and procrastination. If you can teach yourself to move within this five-second window, you win. And in this moment, this rock-bottom moment, God, I swear to God, help me create. I get so, like, just... When you guys hear what has happened with the five-second rule and now the high-five habit, there's no other explanation for this. Mm -hmm. 
that morning the alarm goes off and this five second window it opens up and when you see it you you will just not believe you've never seen it before it's the just do it moment i remembered mel you got to launch yourself out of bed and then i started thinking about doing it this is what psychologists call a bias towards thinking and i started thinking what good's it going to do i don't care i don't feel like it it's dark it's cold i'm 800 grand in debt how's this going to help and then i just started counting five four three two one and all of a sudden i stood up and i used it the next morning five four three two one and the next morning and the next morning and then i started using it any moment i knew what i should do but i didn't feel like doing it i counted backwards five four three two one now the long and the short of it is i didn't understand why it was working then but i understand why it is now when you count backwards five four three two one it's what researchers call a starting ritual mm. It interrupts all the habits stored in your basal ganglia, habit loops like procrastination, anxiety, worry, self-doubt. Mm -hmm. And the counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, requires focus. So as you start to focus on the counting, five, four, three, two, one, your prefrontal cortex engages on the counting. This is the part of the brain that gives you immediate control over what you think and do next. This is the part of the brain that you're using when you're doing any kind of strategic thinking, when you're learning new behavior. This is the part of the brain that helps you change. So when you count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, by the time you get to one, you've got a moment where you can take control. And so I have been sharing this on, this is what actually led me into the business of writing books and being a motivational speaker. It was literally not something I set out to do, but I believe God was like, this crazy lady is the one that's going to get this out in the world. This amazingly normal lady, <laughs> not crazy. That's true, but I meant like in a good way. Yes. And so uh, I uh, first mentioned it in a TEDx talk. In 2011, it's now got 28 million views. Wow. That's what started the speaking career. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many people started writing about the five-second rule. I, despite my dyslexia and ADHD, wrote a book about it. It, uh, it self-published it. It went on to sell 2 million copies, be translated into 36 languages. Oh, and Thank you. But here's the most important part. The five-second rule is now being used by pediatricians around the world to help kids with anxiety. It's being used by veterans organizations to help people program triggers associated with PTSD. And we know of more than 111 people who have stopped themselves from attempting suicide by counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, wow. and asking for help. It, when I was uh, hosting the Mel Robbins talk show, I had an entire wing of psychiatric care nurses show up at the studio and tell me of all the things that they give somebody after an inpatient stay for suicidal ideation, depression, addiction centers reach out to us all the time. The most effective tool they have upon releasing somebody is the five second rule because it's simple, it's easy to remember, and it is so effective at interrupting the thoughts that take us to such dark places. And because when you start counting five, four, three, two, one, you've actually made the decision to take control. Mm -hmm. And so the five second rule helps you push through what the high five habit does, and I think that this is even 10 times more profound than the five second rule, is it uses the science and programming that's already in your body to help you reprogram your relationship with yourself, how you see yourself, how you treat yourself. Mm -hmm. If you do this for five days, just five days, start your day by putting down your toothbrush seeing the human being in the mirror and raising your hand. Don't even say anything. No words of affirmation, nothing. The high, high five, the gesture itself, unlocks all the programming. It will fundamentally change who you are mm. because you're treating yourself differently and your brain sees you treating yourself the way you would treat a friend, the way that you would send a teammate into the game. You're sending yourself as your own best teammate into the game of your life. Mm -hmm knowing that you have your own back. You know, there was a woman that wrote to us um, from a domestic violence shelter, mm -hmm. and she said that she um, had uh, been there for five days. She had seen a video online of the high five habit, and she said, you know, Mel, I've experienced tremendous childhood trauma. Uh, she's right here. This lady right here. Mm -hmm. That lady right there. 
Mm -hmm. I've experienced tremendous childhood trauma from the age of 13 to the age of 14. And I've just experienced this very violent, abusive relationship. I have nothing. Mm -hmm. I have a long road to go for my own healing. But what the high five habit <clears throat> has taught me is that I still have myself. Mm. That I can have my own back. That I can support myself in healing. I love what you said. You said uh, this book is about changing the default programming that keeps us trapped in a destructive and unsupportive relationship with yourself. Yeah. I like, I love that. I love that. I love that phrasing. Yeah, the... it's true. I mean, you've lived it. We've all mm -hmm. lived it. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we would not speak to anybody that we care about the way we, talk we to speak ourselves. to ourselves. Yeah. And that is a learned thing, by the way. You know, maybe you are repeating what your caregivers said to each other or to you. Maybe you are repeating things that were said to you when you were little. And our brains are like sponges when we're little. They're, they're, they're designed to learn patterns. And so a lot of times what people realize when they start using this simple gesture and all the tools in the book, there's another one that, that we should probably talk about, the high five to the heart, um, which is, uh, you know, one of the things about trauma and you all know this, is that it is stored in your nervous system. Absolutely. And so a lot of times we feel so trapped by our behaviors because we go into therapy and you use this part of the brain to talk about what you're going to do differently, but then you get into your life and you get triggered and your nervous system takes over. Mm -hmm. So another tool in the book that is super easy to use and it taps into great science is called high-fiving your heart. You take your hands and you kind of put it right here in the center of your chest mm -hmm. and push in. And here we can do it all together. You push in right in the center of your chest and take a deep breath in and then blow it out. And then you're going to say these words after me. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. safe. I'm safe. I'm loved. I'm loved. What do you feel? Safe. Okay. And loved. At least for the five seconds. And then yeah. after that, I'll get back to reality. <laughs> yeah. And start thinking otherwise. Well, some mornings you might need to say it 83 times. Mm-hmm. You might have some, you know, jerk cut you off in traffic, and you might need to do this at the red light. What you're doing when you press here is you're tapping into a treasure in your body called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is an on-off switch that switches off your sympathetic or your fight-or-flight, stressed-out, traumatized, dysregulated nervous system, and it turns on your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your calm, cool, relaxed nervous system. So what I love about this is you can teach this to your kids, Everybody right now coming out of the pandemic is got a nervous system locked in an on edge, chaotic, stressed out state. That's right. If you grew up in a chaotic household where you felt like at any point the shoe's going to drop, your nervous system is probably still in a stressed out, hyper vigilant state. Absolutely. You can use this free tool that I call high fiving your heart mm -hmm. to use your vagus nerve like an on off switch button and to ground yourself back into a cool, rested nervous system which allows you to feel more calm and comfortable and confident in your own skin. What, what is it about the number five in your life, you think? Uh, I don't know. I didn't, you know, it's interesting because when I wrote The Five Hype Habit, it, it would I didn't set out to say, okay, I got to write a book with a five in it. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think, honest, honestly, I think it, God just like put these things in. There are five of us in our family. I don't know what it is about the number five. You should probably should sit down with like a numerologist and see. Somebody what said five that five is about strength and clarity okay. and freedom. Those okay. are the three things I think that somebody said recently about numerology. But I, I love everything you're saying this morning just because I don't understand why we take ourselves for granted so much. And I think that's why social media plays such a role in people's lives because it's hard to tell yourself you're worthy and it's hard to tell yourself you're great so you get all this validation from outside sources but guess what that's not real yeah you know yeah why do you think that is why is it so hard for why do we take ourselves for granted so much oh i have a theory about this well okay. i think that you know if if you're somebody that had a lot of abuse or chaos or neglect or abandonment or whatever in your household it starts at a really young age if you live in a world that tells you that you are other or you're not equal, or you're disrespected, mm -hmm. or you're dealing with you know institutionalized and systematic racism that treats you with disrespect, you get that message from society. I also think there's this thing that happens for all of us when we're little kids. We all remember that moment 
where you go into elementary school and, you know, the driving force of your life is to fit in because it means safety. And you go from being a kid that was born whole, complete, beautiful, perfect. You'd look in a mirror as a little kid. That, you know, your kids probably look in a mirror and they're like dancing and, you know, kiss the mirror. They don't, no, no toddler steps back from a mirror and are like, God, my thighs are fat. You know, nobody's going <laughs> to like me. But at some point you go into elementary school and you have that tray and your heart is pulling you toward a certain group of kids and your mind turns into that sorting hat from Harry Potter and starts to go, no, 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 no. You can't go to those. Those are the sports kids or those kids don't look like you or those kids yeah. have the fancy clothes. And I think your brain starts to almost reject you as a way to protect you from somebody else's rejection. It starts telling you what you can and can't do. Correct. You see the world in places where you belong and where you don't. And your mind starts to argue against your heart. And I think that's where it begins. Ooh. Where you literally start to look outside of you for the validation that is inside of you. See, I want you to bring self-worth, self-confidence, self-validation, self-respect back in-house because it is an inside job. And again, there's always going to be stuff that happens to you that is hard, that is disrespectful. There are going to be people who fall out of love with you, who don't like you. And that's why you got to stand in front of that mirror every morning and demonstrate, demonstrate that you still see you. See, this is not a like, I'm the best. This is, I forgive you. Yeah. This is, I see you. Mm -hmm. This is, I still got you. That no matter what is going on out there, I, I have your back. I like you. That's you why know? it's very important when you walk in the room to speak to people. Because you're given that same, you know, valid, not even, not even validation, but just I see you as a, yeah. as a human. I never understand people who just walk in the room Me either. and don't speak to people or just walk past people. I just think that's just, it says a lot about them. Yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I was going to say one thing that spoke to me was you talk about two kinds of people, right? People who see obstacles and people who see opportunity. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, I always say this when it comes to business, we'll talk ourselves out of things. And that's what it is in every aspect of life, too. You feel like, okay, well, I really want to do this, but I can't because, like you said in the book, I only have $700 in the bank. So oh, yeah, it's not possible. Story. So can you talk about that a little bit more? Because I know so many people struggle with that. Yeah. So what what uh, you're, you're talking about a story where I got into a, 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 a you know, like an, an Uber and there was a guy driving mm -hmm. and uh, I was on the phone talking about the talk show. And when I hang up, the guy's like, oh, my God, I can't believe you're in the cab. And I said, why? And he goes, I, I think you're here for a reason. I said, great. What, what is it? He said, well, <laughs> I really want to become a, an Oscar winning actor oh, and I want to create other uh, Why did you say, oh, God? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like when people do that. Well, well you, know, like... Well, you know, and, and so, but he didn't get what he thought he was going to get from mm -hmm. me. Uh, and he said, and I want to create other uh, opportunities for black and Latino men to become actors. And I said, great. What the hell are you doing? In Boston, we had to protect his identity, so we put him in Dallas. But what are you doing in Boston? You know, the game is not in Boston, dude. You want to, how old are you? He's like 25. I'm like, do you have a house? He's like, no. I'm like, you married? No, I'm like, what are you doing in Boston? <laughs> if you want to do, if you want to play that game, you get your ass to New York or you get your ass to LA. He's like, but I only have $700. I'm like, perfect. You don't have a house? You don't have kids? You have $700? That'll get you there? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, you got a car. Drive it. You know, like you can drive Lyft. What are you doing? He's like, uh, but I only have, it's, it's expensive. I'm like, how do you know? You don't live there. That's right. And so I'm in the back seat spot. Now look, obviously it's a lot easier to give someone else advice. Mm -hmm. That's the other reason why you got to learn how to look at the person in the mirror and cheer them forward. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you develop an attitude where all you do is see all the reasons why not. Correct. And so in my mind, I saw $700, no kids, no spouse, no obligation as an opportunity. You got enough. You can go figure it out. Let's see how hungry you are. This is the time to go do this. Do not become a 45-year-old with regret. Do you know how much you are going to regret staying where you are staying and That's not right. trying for crying out loud? Right. And so basically, this is a story about how you can train your mind to flip from obstacle to opportunity. And this is going to sound really weird, but, um, you know, as a person of faith, you, I know, see the signs right? You can train your mind to see signs. That's right. And so one of the games that I teach everybody to play, because there's a filter in your brain called the reticular activity system. It's like a giant hairnet that sits over your brain that, that changes in real time. And um, 
one of the things that's cool about it is you've all experienced how fast it can change. Have any of you looked for a new car recently? I was there yesterday. Yeah, okay, so what are you shopping for? <laughs> a BMW, but I don't know if it's going to happen right now because of the backup on cars. My okay. lease is up in January, so I have to get a new car. Okay, well, if BMW, if you're listening, we need a new car here, yeah. right? So, so, but, but, what do you see everywhere now? Uh, what do I see? Yeah. So when now, now that you're shopping for a BMW, yeah, no, I look at BMWs all the time, driving around. I mean, I have one now, but I yeah. have to turn it in. So. Okay, but so what happens when you shop for a new car? Everybody's had this experience. Mm -hmm. You go and you drive a, a red Acura. All of a sudden, you walk out of the dealership. You see red Acuras everywhere. everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's the filter in your brain changing in real time. Oh, 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 hold on. Envy wants to. Uh, Envy's interested in these. Let's let them in. Mm -hmm. they it's were like your phone there. when you think about something. All of mm -hmm. a sudden, everything that pops up on your phone is what you just were a sometimes just thousand thinking about. Percent. So your mind shows you what it thinks is important to you, and when you realize that, you start to realize why it is so damn important to speak to yourself and treat yourself a, a certain way. Because if you continue to say, I'm a failure, I'm a loser, nothing ever works out for me, I'm a bad person, your brain thinks it's important to you to see reasons why that's true. If you are somebody who is adamant about high-fiving yourself, if you're adamant about working on your goals and dreams, if you're adamant about being a positive person, your brain will adjust in real time. Now, one of the ways that you can train yourself, and I'll show you how to do this, is simply today I want you to tell your brain you want to see one naturally occurring heart somewhere in the world. It could be a shape on the top of your coffee. It could be a stain on the floor of your garage. It could be a leaf on the sidewalk. And when you see it, I want you to supersize the exercise. I want you to stop and see the heart, and I want you to literally say to yourself or feel in your body, God, the universe, it put that there for me, right. and I found it. Mm -hmm. right. And that energy in your body makes your filter in your brain go, oh, more hearts. Okay, I got it. And then you're going to start seeing hearts everywhere. And what's going to happen is when I prove to you that your brain changes in real time, you will now understand the magnificent power that you have to start to tell your brain what you want. There is no doubt in my mind you are going to get the BMW. Screw the fact that there's a backlog. Right. <laughs> Don't even mention the backlog because you're going to now see, like, then you will see more and more signs. I want you to see opportunity. Right. Absolutely. And you start by teaching your brain to see these hearts because then you're going to go, whoa, that, that Mel's right. I can change my brain. Mm -hmm. I definitely which means told I can her, change how I talk to myself. I definitely told her in the car dealer, I said, look, I want the car that I want. If I'm paying all this money, let's figure out how you can make it happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you think having a comfort zone is problematic? Um, I think that your comfort zone is problematic if you stay in it because you're afraid to grow. Mm. Like I think you, hum, human beings are designed to grow their mm. entire life. Mm. Your cells regenerate every seven years. Your brain's constantly changing. Heck, we just talked about how the filter in your mind can change. And if you are comfortable and not, if you're comfortable and happy, fabulous. But if you're comfortable and you're not satisfied or you're not happy, that's a problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this is wow. interesting. Yeah, this will be interesting. And one thing I will say that I related to is wanting something really bad is terrifying. Yes. When you really, really want something, it, sometimes it's scary to even just admit it. Well, one of the things that I like to do, everybody has a morning routine. Mine obviously involves the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one, get out of bed. I also don't look at my phone for the first 30 minutes of the day Ooh. because, um, <laughs> it's well, the first well, thing I do. Well, Not I'll me. tell you why you don't want to do that. <laughs> because how many, like, let's take, uh, you know, how many people, like, let's say you've got, I don't know, a million people on Facebook, okay, mm -hmm. that follow you. Would you want all of them to walk into your bedroom? Yeah, to your point, know. do you want a strength? You know, that's what you're doing when you look at your phone. I wake up and I pray. I meditate. Now, the first thing I do is look intention. at my phone because I have to make sure there's no changes in the schedule at work. I'm like, let me just make sure we. No I, I, I would not do that, and let me tell I you do why. It every, every because morning. you're putting all of that before what matters to you. Mm -hmm. And so, if you were to literally try it tonight, take your phone and plug it in in your bathroom or your closet. Do not even have it next to your bed. And if you need to be reached in the middle of the night, tell people to call you and not text you. Because what's interesting about work and what's interesting about family is people will text you all night long. They will not call you unless it's an emergency. Mm -hmm. That way you're reachable. 
Then when the alarm goes off, presumably it's on your phone, you're now can't lay in bed. You've got to get up to go to the phone to turn it off. So you sort of set yourself up to have to get out of bed, not lay there and think about things and worry, which is where a lot of people have anxiety. Cortisol levels are very high in the morning. You turn off your phone, then put it face over and walk away from it. Take the first 30 minutes for you. Your dreams, you, you deserve 30 minutes. Even five minutes. I do that on the weekend. I don't know about during the week. But I also don't wake up from my phone. Like, if anybody texts me or calls me, I will not wake up until my alarm goes off in the morning or right before my alarm goes off. So I never know if something, like, important happens. I just want you to try it. Try, I, give me five minutes. Give up. me five minutes. <laughs> Maybe Put five. yourself first <laughs> I mean, yeah, before I, I the world comes in. I, I, don't, I, I can't do that. I'm like, yeah. But I, I'll I do, do five. I'll do five. I do an hour. So what happens is, is I wake up. First of all, I don't need an alarm to wake up anymore. My body wakes me up at 4.30 a.m. every morning. That is amazing. So you should never be um, late. But, you know, what I do is I have five kids. So my daughter who goes to NYU, I make sure she texts me if she's arriving back at her apartment or if she's going somewhere. So that's the first thing I check to make sure that she's safe. Yep. The first thing, boop, I text. Dad, I'm, I made it back safe. I do the same thing with then my daughter I, in L.A. Then <laughs> I can go on with my day. Then I can go take my shower, I do my prayer, I kiss my wife, I go kiss my kids. And then, But the first thing I have to do, and this is I learned from my dad, is the first thing I have to make sure my family's safe. That's the first thing I do regardless. Check that text. Yeah. Then I won't look at social media. It'll yeah, just be so how do you go to sleep then? Messages. What do you mean? How do you go to sleep if, if she hasn't texted you back? Like if I sent the text to my daughter and she wasn't in yet, it would be hard for me to sleep. I, could, I wouldn't be able to lay well, down. Well, I, do, I do have a problem. That, well, that's my problem. I don't mm -hmm. sleep. But if I do fall asleep or something happens, let's say my, my daughter is out studying or something like that, I won't sleep. I, I, it's difficult for me to sleep, and I'm always waiting for that phone to ring because mm -hmm. I'm waiting for her to be like, hey, Dad, I'm safe. Mm -hmm. but that's my difficult part. Mm -hmm. So then when I see that text, whether it's my mother or it's my father or somebody that's traveling, whatever, mm -hmm. I see that text, then I can get up from my day. But um, that's what I have to do. And then I'm, I'm like, e, the second thing I look at is the show. Charlemagne's not coming in today. He's not broadcasting. That means I'm broadcasting from home. That means, you know what? I'm closing my eyes for another hour. <laughs> so that's the second thing. Then when I yep. see that email out there, then I can... Damn, you know, well, I'm, I'm realizing this show not a priority media. in my life. Because <laughs> I get up and I thank God and I, you know, I give gratitude and I meditate. Then I kiss my family. I don't talk to them until like 5.30. When I'm close to work driving, I might look at my Texas something. Yeah, like I that. cannot. I can't look at this. I have to put everything. Mm -mm. I have to like get my mind straight. I got it. And then I always write down five things that I want in the morning right. as another way to train my mind to just focus on the things that I desire, that I want, to allow myself to dream, to give myself permission to want those things. And here's the thing, though, is that I don't think that your dreams are necessarily meant to be achieved. Mm -hmm. I think your dreams have this purpose of being a beacon out in front of you that pull you through your fear and your anxiety and your circumstances to be greater than you are right now. Word. Well, Mel, we wow. appreciate you for joining us this yeah. morning. No, nah, we definitely do. You know what, too? Uh, do you think you got a bad rap? I mean, not a bad rap, a bad uh, shake with your TV show? No, I thought, yeah, I think that... Again, at the very beginning, we said that life is the most is the hardest and most amazing school year ever attend. Mm -hmm. And I think absolutely everything is preparing you for what's coming mm -hmm. next. Mm -hmm. And it had always been a dream of mine to do a daytime syndicated talk show that really gave people like you guys are tools, not only entertainment, but tools and life changing information that can help somebody really take control or improve their lives. And I learned a tremendous amount. It was a, a tremendous gift and it prepared me for what's coming next. I'm actually happy it's over Absolutely. because I love uh, audio more. I like, uh, I'm a digital entrepreneur. You can reach more people that way. You have more creative freedom. And so I learned a massive amount. But it was just preparing me. You see the opportunity. Yeah. You see the right. opportunity. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Well, well, you, you're with the right the guy if you care about audio. My guy, Mark. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, it's Mel Robbins. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Thank you.